Ladies and gentlemen, I told you in all my sessions I'd be kind of buffeted. And this sermon, I, I just spoke a little bit at the Covenant Church the other day, and it's been percolating in me for about three years. I'm a man, I don't like mistakes. Mistakes cost money and time. And uh, especially when you're dealing with ministry, because when you make a mistake or you don't repent or whatever, God stops, he loves you. I mean, you, 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 you still gonna go to heaven because you know, you, you ask God to come in your heart. Not the issue, the issue is, but you have to kind of back up. And sometimes, you notice you can't go as fast backing up as you do going forward. Because you'll blow a gear if you're in a car or whatever. So if you got your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the book of Luke chapter four. I love Luke four because there's such a powerful, powerful passage of scripture. And I've realized and wondered how come so many people have made mistakes, some of them had destroyed their ministries or really delayed it and hindered it for many, many years. And then they finally got back on track. And I found out something about Satan. He's not a faith devil. He's a flesh devil. He never tempts you in the spirit. He can only tempt you in the flesh. But if you crucify your flesh daily instead of Sunday, you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. He can't tempt you spiritually. He's spiritually dead. And I'll give you a prime example. Have you ever been tempted to tithe? <laughs> well, no. Why is that? Because tithing is a spiritual concept. You have to understand it from the spirit. And once you understand it from the spirit, you'll tithe all the days of your life. Because the word of God is not soulish. I said that in one of my sessions. See, the word of God is spirit. That's why the natural man receiveth not the things of God. Because they're foolish is unto him, neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. Because, see, most people, they'll look at the word of God in soulish realm, in the mind, the will, and the emotion. And they'll read something Jesus said, and they'll say, well, I know he said that, but he just can't seem to mean that. But see, because you're looking at it from the soulish realm instead of from the spirit, because we worship God in spirit and in truth. He said, I'm a spirit, Jesse, and so are you made in my, my image. So I want to read, and I like the old King James Version. I want to talk tonight, and I want you to listen to me. Because the Lord, when he gave this to me, he said, uh, and I, I, I preached it, I think it was last Sunday, some, at the cup of the church, a piece of it anyway. Yeah, I want to talk tonight between the difference between a temptation and a manifestation. The difference between a temptation and a manifestation, which are very, very close. Because see, T Satan's going to always tempt you with something you want. Something you possibly believe in for. And how do you know the difference when they look so much alike? And God gives us this in Luke chapter 4 verse 1. And Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost. Notice he wasn't half full. He was full. Everybody say full. full. See. And when you're full, which means you can't put no more in you. He's being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Being 40 days tempted of the devil. Now underline this, Jesus being full of the Holy, Holy Ghost in your Bible there. Verse 2, being 40 days tempted of the devil and in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said, notice the devil didn't talk until he got hungry. Because when you're hungry, you can make a bad decision. If you go shopping for groceries when you're hungry, you're going to go broke. <laughs> you're going to buy everything you can get your hands on. I'm going to read verse 2 again. Being 40 days... Tempted of the, of the devil. In those days he did eat nothing. And after, when he ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, underline the word if. Because see, if is a devil's word. And I'll deal with that in a few minutes. And the devil said unto him, verse 3, If thou be the son of God, command that this stone that it be made bread. Jesus answered him saying, notice there was no time frame. He immediately answered. It is written. Now, before you say it's written, you got to know what is written. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. 
And the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed him, him all the kingdom of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, all this power, which means wealth, and, and will I give and the glory of them. Glory is the wealth and power is the ability to get it. For that is delivered unto me. Now who delivered it to him? The first Adam. Yeah. See, see the problem with the church world in, this, in the secular world, they love the first Adam more than they love the second Adam. Yeah. Yeah. It was delivered unto me. And to whomsoever I will, I give it. If, that's that devil word. Thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, get thee behind me, Satan. Do you have the ability to tell the devil to get behind you and you're not worried about it? Or you prefer to kind of keep your eye on the boy in front of you? <laughs> but when you're full of the Holy Ghost, he surrounds you the Holy Ghost. He said, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, that's Logos, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. He brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple. Satan never misses church, do you? Never. He says church is the most important thing in Satan's life. Did you know that? Why? To try to stop it. Because that's what destroys him. The gates of hell can't prevail against the church. Watch this. He brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, if there's that devil word, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down from hence. Now, why is he saying that? Because he don't know. He thought Abel was the son of God, so he had Cain kill it. Trying to find this Jesus because he's not a faith devil, he's a flesh devil. That's right. He said, if thou be the son of God, Cast thyself down from hence. Watch this. So now Satan begins to quote Logos. Satan knows a lot about the Bible, more than most theologians. And you need a good theologian to help you misunderstand it. This is Satan talking now. For it is written, notice it's black, it ain't red. He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. Now how did he know that? Because at one time he took care of Jesus. He's an angel, an angel, an angelic being who was a worship leader. And in their hands, they shall bear thee up. So he's got power. Lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus answered and said unto him, it is said. Now he goes from Logos to Rhema. Mm -hmm. He said, let me deal now with the spoken word. See, Satan can only quote Logos but God has given you the ability to quote Rhema, which moves mountains. It is said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Would, read that. You are tempting somebody you shouldn't be messing with. When the devil ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. So that's three months. How'd you like to go three months without a problem in the world? A season. Now, years ago, I preached on this passage and I dealt with the first temptation. Turn the stone into bread. Jesus said, no. Why? You never use, you can write this down if you want. You never use the word of God for personal advantage. Why? Because see, the word of God has already advantaged you. He said, if you speak, you will receive. When you pray, believe that you receive and you shall have it. So you never use the word of God for personal advantage because it's already advantaged you. Then he took him up and said, hey, let me show you these things. And uh, all you got to do is just worship me. So what Jesus said, and I'll paraphrase it, the second temptation, never associate yourself with wicked people, even for the attainment of a good end. Never do that. I've had people say, how can you build buildings under budget? Because I will not allow somebody that doesn't know Jesus to build God's building. Why? Because Psalms 1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Because see, if you're receiving counsel from the ungodly, you're receiving counsel from him or her who's making money. And they're interested in making as much money as they can on this particular project. That's why a lot of you struggle to pay that note. And you go way over budget. Because you possibly hired somebody you shouldn't. You never bring the devil in your camp especially when you're building something for God. So the first temptation, never use the word of God for personal advantage. The second temptation, never associate yourself with wicked people, even for the attainment of a good end, even though you're believing for something. 
Now then Satan said, that ain't working, so let's take him up there and quote some scriptures since he's, he's scripture-minded. He does all that. And he said, now all you got to do is just jump off. He tried that again on Jesus at the cross through the thief. He said, if you're really son of God, just take yourself off the cross and take me off too. Same temptation, but in a different, with a different bag on it, a different color. And that third temptation was, you never perform a godly act in a prideful spirit. And a lot of Pentecostals in the, in the beginning of Pentecost did that. They start casting out devils and say, what's your name, devil? Because Jesus asked the devil, what's your name? My name is Legion. What street you live in hell? Who cares where he lives? Who cares what his name is? Just tell him to shut up and get out. Jesus didn't let him talk very much. So in other words, you never use the word of God for personal advantage. Number two, you never associate yourself with wicked people for the attainment of a good end. And number three, you never perform a godly act in a prideful spirit. See, he's trying, he is reaching out to Jesus' pride. Now, I want to go back to the second temptation. The difference between temptation and manifestation. And the devil taking him up to a high mountain showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world, that's verse 5. In a moment of time, and the devil said unto him, all this power, or do not most will I give, and the glory, the wealth of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me. If you look at your Amplified in verse 7, he said, if you worship me once. Notice he did it when no one was around. So nobody going to know we're out in the desert. It's just me and you, man. Mm -hmm. Hey, and what did I just show you? Let me tell you what he showed Jesus. He showed Jesus the Roman Empire. He showed Jesus the Persian Empire. He showed Jesus the Indian Empire. He showed Jesus the Chinese Empire and every other kingdom on the earth. Why did Jesus come? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Didn't say would not, say should not perish, but have everlasting life. He showed Jesus everything Jesus wanted. Think about that for a minute. Everything Jesus was believing for. All you got to do is worship me. It's an, who gonna know? It's just us out here. Once. It don't have to be every day. Once. All it took for Adam and Eve to lose what they had was one bite. Now, some people say it was an apple. Okay, we'll, we'll call it an apple. They didn't have to eat the whole apple. Just one bite. Think about that. The difference between a temptation and a manifestation Write this down if you're taking notes. Beware of the beginnings of discontentment and covetousness. It becomes easy when you're hungry. When you're hungry, you're going to make decisions you shouldn't make. You're going to eat more than you should eat. You're going to buy more groceries than you should buy. He waits till you get discontented. Maybe you've been believing God for a long time to see something happen. He started getting discontented. But what stopped, what, what made Jesus know the difference between a temptation and a manifestation? He was full of the Holy Ghost. Yet he's looking at everything he's believing for. Everything. He's hungry. All you got to do is, hey, nobody out here but us. Just once. Just once. Once, go and they amplify that's verse seven. Read it, they'll say, just once. See, he figured he's weak now. What Satan didn't realize that he was full of the Holy Ghost. He may have been hungry, but he was really full spiritually. But he waited for discontentment and covetousness. But Jesus wouldn't covet because covetousness and discontentment could not enter into him because he was full. Write this down. There are no short roads to manifestation. If it's a small price, it's a big lie. There's no short roads to manifestation. If it's a, <laughs> if it's a small price, it's a big lie. I've had people, see, I, I preach at Bible schools all the time, and I got guys saying, man, I'm going into ministry, and I want to start up making $100,000 a year. Six figures. That's great, son. You done lost your ever-loving mind. 
Why? Because you, you, have you ever made a hundred thousand? No, no. Well, then you don't know how to handle no hundred thousand dollars. See, everybody thinks me and Jerry and Brother Copeland and Gloria, we've had this all our life. No, it took some time. It took some discipline. It took some dedication. It took some commitment to understand how to receive without getting intoxicated with the success. See, the world is intoxicated with the success so bad that if you get a jet, they're mad at you. You shouldn't have that because a drunk man wants it all. But when you fill of the Holy Ghost, all those things are a tools. What is jewelry but the byproduct of gold or platinum or steel or whatever, whatever you wearing. You see what I'm saying? It's just a byproduct. But when you understand, what's the original thing? And there are a lot of, I've seen some great men and women build some beautiful churches and lost them because they got discontented. They got hungry and Satan came. Bond, they got the building up, but they couldn't pay it. And it hurt more people than it ever helped. How many times that ministers, pastors would tell the, their staff, you got to give to this to this project and make them give and get more. They would do it. And then when they couldn't meet the note, lay the people off that gave. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. I heard Brother Hagin say that, so I adopted that myself. <laughs> See, there are no short roads to manifestation. If it's a small price, it's a big lie. The ifs, write this down, the ifs of Satan are a splendid lie. The ifs of Satan are a splendid lie. If is a devil's word, and what does it do? It loosens the cord of faith because it automatically sets a doubt into your life. If. I want you to step out by faith. But if it don't work, now you're trying to protect God's reputation. And he don't need your protection. You need his. So if is a devil, if thou be the son of God. Now if you do this, I'll do that. Now watch, this, watch the slyness of Satan. He says, all shall be thine. Now that's what Jesus came for. To touch the world. Hired 12 apostles to go in the world. Everything Jesus was believing for, Satan had it. But he had conditions to it. So the ifs of, boy, y'all are quiet. Y'all listening here. The ifs of Satan are a splendid lie. If is a devil's word that loosens the cord of faith. Let me give you an example of that. When I went into the ministry, I'm from, this, I'm from South Louisiana. I was born and raised in New Orleans. In fact, I met that there. They said, have you lived in New Orleans all your life, brother Jesse? I said, not yet. We still here. Glory to God. <laughs> now, I've always liked Texas. Y'all know, some, the Southwest believe it, I, I wear boots and jeans. I just, oh, oh. I've always wanted to be a cowboy, but I don't know how to, I don't even know how to handle a cow, much less be the boy of it. <laughs> but I like, I, I like it, you know, and, and I love Texas because it's land. And glory to God, I like land, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So when I went out in the full-time ministry, it, well, actually when I got born again, the Lord said, go back to Louisiana, because me and Kathy started our marriage out in Arlington, Texas. We got, we got married at Holy Rosary Catholic Church there in Louisiana. Three days later, we were in Arlington, and I was on the contract at the end of the Six Flags with Six Flags over Texas. Uh, the, the, I can't think of that. Uh, Angus Wynn was the head who owned all that stuff, you know, uh, and, uh, and, and, and I was an entertainer. That's how I started. So my God, after I got born again, I said, let's go back to Texas. I, oh, when I started preaching, I went full time. Now watch this. It's everything. I just wanted to go to Dallas. Or Fort Worth, or I just need, I wanted to come to Texas. I said, I just like Texas. I'm going to buy me a cow. <laughs> Maybe I can get me some land. Because see, we don't sell land by the acre where we live. We get it by the square foot. Very expensive in Louisiana. Woo, Lord. Because there's no more land. We lose 100 yards a minute just on the coastal erosion. And they're doing everything they can to stop that. Now watch this. One of the biggest churches ever in the city of Dallas called me. I had been preaching two or three years now. And Richard, if I got a $200 offering back then, that, that'd be big money. Now you gotta understand, it was nothing for me to make a million dollars when I was, when I was playing music, that, that ain't nothing. But I thought you had to be poor. So you know, it's what, I didn't mind being poor because you know, I was raised poor. But I, I hadn't studied the word, I didn't understand sowing and reaping, I just understood sowing. Now watch this, this wonderful church had 6,000 people in it. 
That's big way back. That's 1979. And they said, Jesse, you are so unique and different. We would like for you to come to Dallas, Texas. I thought, that's got to be God. Because that's exactly what I'm believing for. We want you to come and all you have to do is preach every Sunday night at our church. You can still be an evangelist. You can still travel Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. But, but get back Sunday so you can preach Sunday night. We will give you a house. A house. We will give you a car. Oh, God. A car. Yeah. Oh, and we will give you offices and we'll put all the furniture free of charge. I said, this is everything I believe. Because I tell Kathy, boy, if we could go to Dallas and get a, you know, we can get some offices. And, and, you know, and and I would say, you know how many preachers are in Dallas? And all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it was everything I wanted. But they had an if to it. And when the if came out, I said, well, it's just a small thing. That's what causes you to fall but it's a big lie. That's exactly what I wanted. And the Lord said, don't take that. I said, but that's what I'm, that's what I'm believing for. He said, well, believe me for it, not them. And I said, how come you just got to ruin everything? (laughs) I wanted it, Jerry, I wanted that, man. I, I, I was believing for that. I said, Lord, Jesus. So we have a Cajun, uh, Terminology called boudé. I started boudé. Y'all would call it pout. He said, okay, you little flesh creature. I said, okay, God, forgive me. I'll stay, I'll stay put. I'll do what you want me to do. But do I have to like it? He said, no, you just have to love it. Within six months, that church split, messed up, adultery, fornication, financial improprieties. If I'd have been in the middle of that, I'd have got slammed. But in my mind, I had this deal, all shall be thine. Just like Satan said to Jesus. It was, it was a temptation and not a manifestation. Write this down. Man cannot be happy without speech. Oh, I love what they said, Billy. Beware of the art of conversation though. Satan knows how to talk. And he waits till you're discontented and hungry. I mean, you've been believing God a long time for something. Oh, you end up. Most people do. say faith and patience you inherit. That's right. Let patience have its perfect work that you're perfect and entire that's in the book of James, wanting nothing. Patience will get you what you want, not need, if you let it develop you. No, you know, you can learn more from a mistake than you can from a, a blessing. Because sometimes people know, don't know how to handle the blessing. And if you learn from the mistake, never to do it again, it'll give you great wisdom. And, there, and you can see even the patriarch, made, Abraham made a mistake. He made a mistake over Ishmael. We got that problem today. Yes. See, the problem never goes away because Satan uses it, not for just one generation. He's not interested in just touching one person. He want to get them all. Yes. So write this down. Never invite death to rock the cradle of spiritual life. You never invite death to rock the cradle of spiritual life. Because you see, Satan never misses church in the book of Revelation chapter two, I believe it's verse 13, that, that he says to the church at Pergamos, he, this Satan has a seat in the church. Mm-hmm. He's sitting in the church. Now, I, I, now don't misunderstand. J- Satan will not put baseball or football over church service. And nothing wrong with going to football's game. Or, I'm not talking, I mean, he will not do it because it just takes one word a rhema, and it destroys him. So he causes confusion. But he does it with things you like. Notice how he twists things. It's no longer gambling in Vegas. 
It's gaming. It's no longer adultery. It's an affair. Remember this, the movie Affair to Remember? Notice that. He's twisting that. Or we call it today spinning it. Notice how he changes those things. Because see, everything he does is very sensual. Very fleshy. He'll make a man that got gray hair on his chest make him think he still got the stuff. <laughs> man, you need to talk to your wife. She'll tell you. She'll say, you ain't got the stuff no more, boy. <laughs> but to that crazy man, oh, I tell you what, boy, I still got it. That's all I'm going to say about that. But anyway, <laughs> you never invite death to rock the cradle of spiritual life. Why would a church invite Satan to sit in it? There are churches now that you can go to and there are, we have, a lot of times we have cafes and cappuccino. Now they serve wine and beer and liquor. Let me help those people that believe that's okay to drink. You know what the government calls it? Spirits. They tax it. Do you know what they call it? Sin tax. And you call it Jack Daniel, black label. Johnny Walker, red. CC and seven, Canadian club. You know all that? Drank every bit of it. 151 Puerto Rican rum, Bacardi light. Ooh, PCP, crystal meth, heroin, cocaine. Snort it through a hundred dollar bill up your nose. Whoa! Isn't it amazing I'm still alive? Everything I said, I did. And the devil made me think I was having fun. because it was sensual. I had invited death to rock my cradle. Thank God for the mercy of God, a yeah. praying mama and a praying wife. Yes. I wouldn't be here. You see what I'm saying? But it's so tempting. But it's what you want. Ah, Re write this down. Don't bargain with Satan. If you do, you're gratifying ambition at the cheapest rate. Don't bargain with Satan. If you do, you are gratifying ambition at the cheapest rate. A worldly mind will welcome it. See, a worldly mind will tell you that the Bible is hate speech. Do you know in the great nation of Canada, you can't preach against home? You can't preach, my God, in a certain chapter in the book because it deals with homosexuality? Oh, no. Now they look at the Bible and say, that's hate speech. Why are we having so much trouble? I heard uh, one of those guys on Fox that, uh, I can't call his name, but he was the head person there. He said, because people are no longer believing in God anymore. Look what we got. Look what we have today. And the church, God gave the church an opportunity on 9-11. My God, man. People went to church after uh, we, they were attacked there in Manhattan. And what did the church do? The same stupid thing they did. They gave no life, no nothing, and people quit within two to three weeks. Isn't that amazing? We had an opportunity. I was asked to speak at the Senate in uh, the state of Louisiana. Remember that, Kathy? Right after Hurricane Katrina. Oh, all the world was focused on Katrina. So the Senate there in St. Louis asked me to come and speak a word. Not enough, so I thought, man, that's hard. Why would they want me, you know? But I went, because Kathy told me to go. <laughs> I, I'm not political at all. I tell you if I like you or I don't like you, now, you know, I, 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 I do that at the voting box, at the ballot box. I want to know what you believe in and you know, what's your agenda and what's your platform and blah, 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 this and that. Make a long story short, I went up there and, and the, so the senator, or the, uh, the head of the Senate, he says, now, brother, he said, Reverend DePlantis, they they going to be listening to everything you say, but they're very noisy and loud. They got all their, got all their uh, computers on. He says, so don't be offended by that. Every speaker, you just have to speak over, the, over all the hollering. And talking. I said, okay. So I walked up and I said, hello, ladies and gentlemen. I am Reverend Jester DePlantis, and I've been invited to speak to you. And, uh, and while they're still talking, I said, and I've come to pray. When I said pray, the whole place went stone cold silent. They turned around and looked. The, sent, the head of the president of the Senate went, I mean, nobody say a word. 
I said, what? Some, all kind of bosh. And I said, the eyes of the world are on us and on the state of Louisiana because of Hurricane Katrina. We have an opportunity to be a blessing to those that have been tragically hurt. We have an opportunity to show people how we can turn tragedy into a blessing. We can, how people who are helping us show and show them the results of what the great state of Louisiana will do because they open up their hearts. They open up the Astrodome there in Houston so people could have a place to go because New Orleans was flooded out. You could, not, you could hear a pin drop. And then I prayed for them and they all bowed their heads. And I said, thank you for this great opportunity. Don't let it go by because God opened it up for this great state. And I walked away and that senator says, can I take a picture with you? He said, my God. He said, would you like to help me on my campaign? I said, no. I said, I'm not really political. I said, well, I just came here to pray. And he said, my God. He said, I've been here, tw was it 28 years, something like that? He said, it's never been silent. And guess what? There's a billion dollars that was given. Nobody knows where it's at. <laughs> Trying to find it. And I had wonderful pastors, great pastors that set $100,000 donations. They said, if you wanted to get to the people, you sent it to Jesse the Planets. And I told my staff and I told my finance about, we will not keep $1 of this. I want records that the, that money comes in to the people that use it. And my God, we gave away $3 million to help people all over the state of Louisiana that were flooded out. Am I right, Kathy? It was amazing. Never, never kept my, you know, one preacher told me, he said, man, I ain't getting money to that. He said, man, I built me another building. I never could haul a razor, so I just took it. That's fraud. What's his name? I can't tell you that. That has to do with the United States government. That's none of my business. Thanks for listening to this powerful message by Jesse Duplantis. Remember to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell in order to be up to date with all things Jesse Duplantis Ministries. For more information, visit our website at jdm.org. This media is copyrighted by Jesse Duplantis Ministries for the private use of our audience. Any other use of this media or of any pictures or accounts without Jesse Duplantis Ministries' consent is strictly prohibited.